like to have you turn in your hymnal, if you would, to 381 and 503. Uh, the words are also overhead, but uh, Make Me a Servant is a piece that you may not be familiar with, so let's sing it one time at least, sitting down, and try it together. Shall we please make me a servant? tonight. Um, nothing new other than uh, what we had this morning, except to say that college and career um, afterwards will be leaving and going uh, downtown to uh, have a bite to eat or have coffee or something. So if you want to go with us, college and career, uh, we'll just meet out in the lobby and uh, figure out where we're going right afterwards tonight. But tonight we also have a business meeting right after the service. 
Also, tomorrow, once again, we are taking the juniors and the junior hires up to Camp Kobiak. And it's going to be a great week. We have, I want to say, 26 kids going to Kobiak. And um, maybe it was 27, but around that number. Um, we'll know definitely tomorrow morning before I leave. So we'll see. I hope. So pray for us this week. Uh, we're going to have a great time. And uh, there's a lot of kids who have never been to camp before, and especially some of those younger ones when they're going into third grade. It's quite a big deal to leave mom and dad for a whole week. So uh, pray for them. Uh, tomorrow as we leave, we're going to be at the church at 10 o'clock and leave by 1030. Also, don't forget to bring uh, money for McDonald's as we'll stop there on the way up. Uh, Tuesday, men's, we have our uh, breakfast and Bible study at Valley Coney Island. Uh, be there at 830. And then ladies prayer time later at 10 o'clock on the same day. Once, one more time, if you want to go on the canoe trip, see Bob Carsey. That's uh, for next Saturday, I believe. And uh, I know he's getting canoes reserved and all that. That'll be a great time. Monday the 3rd, uh, we are having still a teen activity. And uh, we're going to have a great time with that. So look in the bulletin that I give to all the teens for more announcements. Um, mark your calendars. Once again, Jimmy DeYoung will be with us Sunday the 23rd through Wednesday the 26th. And I'm really excited about that. So uh, make sure that uh, you're here for that uh, at great time. I didn't announce this this morning, but uh, Mountain Toppers next meeting will be on Thursday, August 20th, starting at 11. So if that includes you, make sure to mark those times. Before we have the offering, I'm going to ask Jack to come, and he's going to give our missionary letter. told to move this mic down a little bit because I bend over because I can't see that far, you know, so Gloria tells me when to turn and everything like that, so anyway, this is from the Chatlas who are, are uh, missionaries to India and it, in this letter you're going to find out the culture that some of our missionaries uh, go into and how difficult uh, things can be so listen carefully no, I can't even see this Greetings to you in Jesus' name, the name above every name. Before I write our update about our transition and ministry, I would like to share about the small experience I had in the church ministry. Ever since I arrived in India, we got busy with a lot of pending works for school and assisting the fellowship churches, preaching in two different churches every Sunday and participating in weekly meetings and midweek services. It was uh, just two days ago I had an opportunity to do the funeral of one of our church members, a widow of age 73 who died from a heart attack. She was the uh, only lady in her family saved about nine years ago and prayed and shared God's, the gospel with her sons and daughters many years, but no one got saved. But only one of her grandchild, uh, uh, Mr. Sabinus, whom she raised, came to know the Lord and was very faithful in living for him and going in the Lord. He shared the story with tears and it was very challenging for him to convince all of his family members to perform the funeral in God-honoring way rather than doing in Hindu tradition like burning and rituals and so on. Though she told her immediate family members and relatives to let her funeral be done by God's servants, they tried to call the Hindu priest but her, her grandson opposed, and because of that, he was ridiculed by his family. Finally, he convinced them to do according to the scriptures. It was a challenging time for me and shared the gospel to all the attendees at the funeral. It was a challenging part at this time. The time has come to lift the casket with the body and walk into the burial ground. According to the tradition, her sons and brothers carried the casket by taking turns. As we are moving, one of her relatives asked me if they could put down the casket for a minute. I agreed. I asked if they were tired. Then they said, no, we're not tired, but it's our custom that we put down the casket and speak to her in her ears so that she could, uh, she could get up. So it is a custom for Hindus that before they reach the burial ground, they will put the casket down three times and speak into her ears. I told them gently that we don't believe in that custom. They listened and carried the casket all the way to the burial ground. Another challenging part is that after we reached to the burial ground, uh, one of her relatives said that they need to go around the place three times where she is going to be buried. Again, her grandson 
intervene and ask me if we could do if they could do that but I said no again and read the scripture and prayed at the burial ground the reason I am writing all of you this to you that many Hindus who come to know the Lord are very much persecuted and ridiculed by their own relatives and family members her grandson told me that he could face some challenges from his family members, but he said whatever that comes his way from the family members, he's ready to face with the Lord. Now this is the interesting part here. Uh, a lot of you ladies, if you were Hindu before uh, 1829, this was what would happen to you. People heard the word, and this is still going on here, and prayed and prayed. Please pray that the Lord will work in their hearts and come to know the saving knowledge of Christ. Also, please pray for her grandson as he stood all by himself to do this and gone out in a God honoring way and pleasing to the Lord. I wish I could send you the pictures of all this at the time. All these traditions and customs remind me about uh, William Carey and his ministry uh, in India. In 1799, Carey witnessed the first burning of an Indian widow at the funeral of her husband, which is called, I wish I could pronounce it, but it's a long Indian word, meaning that his wife should follow the destination of her husband, which actually means that, uh, the word means that, uh, that means dying. Uh, the, wid the widow would have to, uh, if her husband died, uh, she would actually be burned alive followed him in death, and that was a custom of the Hindus back in those days. But thankfully, uh, he was deeply moved and, and implored the English government to prohibit such parts. For some reason, the practice was undisturbed until 1828, when Lord William uh, Beatnick was made Governor General. One of the first acts was to have this cruel custom absolutely stopped. On December the 4th, 1829, the necessary edict was signed and given to Carey to translate into Bengali in order that it might be uh, published in both languages. The, the message reached him Sunday morning. Going aside his quaint black coat, he explained, No church for me today. If I delay an hour to translate and publish this, many a widow's life may be sacrificed. The authorities had to transition before evening. He completed its complete abolition came under Lord William Bunnick uh, through a regulation declaring a practice of what they call suti, uh, whether voluntary or not, illegal and punishable by criminal courts. Hinduism is more culture than the creed. Praise God that our Lord Jesus Christ broke the bonds of all the cultures and customs and made us all one in the cross. My heart is heavy for our people, and could you please join us and pray the Lord will open our, their hearts to the gospel and to the saving knowledge of Christ. This is from the chaplains. Those of you who want to come to work. To pray for our missionaries, many of them have to go into cultures that are completely uh, foreign to, to what we do here in America. Let's pray. Father, thanks again for this day, Father. Thank you for the message this morning, Father. May we apply it to our hearts and, and uh, just uh, challenge us, Father, through your word tonight as well. Pray for uh, the pastor and his family as they're traveling back. I pray that you'll give them a, a time of rest and relaxation and come back refreshed, Father. I pray now that you'll get the Chatlas and all our missionaries, Father, who are in uh, different cultures, Father, and customs. I pray that uh, you will help them to adopt to it, Father, and to stand strong uh, when those customs uh, uh, are different from what the Word teaches. I pray now that you'll bless your offering. I pray that uh, it will be used to bring honor and glory to your name. Lord, in your name we pray. Amen.
notice that I didn't get everything set up the way I usually do. So if I'm a little slow in between, I hope that you'll accept my apology in advance. We're going to start off by singing, Blessed. Oh. 
plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Dear dying Lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Till Church of God, be saved to sin no more. When this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, then in a nobler, sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. I'm excited to hear from Brother Tom tonight. Tom is such a blessing to our church. Uh, he and Kelly help in so many ways around here, um, from the website to all the different tech issues that are way above my head. And um, if it wasn't for him, we'd have a lot of issues on that level, on that side of things. But I really appreciate how they have made, they've come in on Wednesday nights and help with our Truth Tracker program. They lead that. We just do a phenomenal job, and I'm just excited to have Tom come tonight and bring the message. So Tom, watch. So uh, the other night, Kelly and I were talking, and she asked if I thought Pastor Meese watched these services when he's gone. So to find out, I brought my Apocrypha, and I figured we'd read from that. Okay, all kidding aside, uh, if you could go ahead and turn in uh, 2 Corinthians 12. And uh, while you're finding your place there, we, we love to hear stories about answered prayer. We see it uh, from the colleges, from the Christian colleges, and uh, from some of the kids in our in our own church and some of the families here that are going through struggles and and the prayers that are answered and uh, we get a thrill out of it we get a zeal we get uh, encouraged and then that encourages us to go home and pray more um, we get to the point where we're absolutely convinced that our heart is is on the same level as God's and we're praying for exactly what God wants us to pray for. And, and, uh, but what happens when we pray for that over and over and over and it seems that heaven is silent? I dare say more often than not, we go months without the answers we're seeking. 
But as time goes on, we can always look back and see the answer. But when we're in the midst of that trial, when we're in the midst of these situations that cause us to plead with God, sometimes we get to the point where we give up. We ask ourselves, is it worth it? Did I do something wrong? Does God even hear me or does He even care? Uh, A while back, I think it was 2011, he quit, but there was a cable TV mogul, Ted Turner. Most of you guys might remember him. Uh, He was the loudest voice criticizing the Christians of the day. At that point in his life, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution quoted him as saying that he was saved seven or eight times in his life but he had become disenfranchised or dis- disenchanted with Christianity when, despite his prayers for his sister, she still passed. This was a man that was planning to hit the mission field. Obviously, we see he had struggles in his Christian life um, prior to this situation, um, based off of the fact that he was saved seven or eight times. But my point in this story is no matter how our spiritual or how spiritual you may be, there are going to be times when God says no. It doesn't matter how much you have sacrificed or endured for the cause of Christ. Just ask Paul, as we're about to read, as he had endured a lot. It doesn't matter either how much you have accomplished for the cause of Christ. There will be times that we feel that God has turned His face on us. There will be times that we feel that heaven is silent or maybe that heaven didn't ever exist. There will even be times that you feel that God hates you or that God is out there just trying to squash you like a bug or to take you down. That being said, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll start in verse 7. Just go into verse 10. A very short passage today. Just to see what a godly man's response to such a situation is. Starting in verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made pure or perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will, I will, or will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For I am, or for when I am weak, then I am strong. The first thing I want to look at in verse seven is how we should treat trials from God. First of all, we need to treat them as a gift from God, given specifically to us for us to teach us. Verse seven it says, uh, "Unless I should be exalted above measure through." the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. We read through before Corinthians here, and I was trying to find out what that thorn in his flesh could be. Some commentators think it was blindness, some think it was other diseases or sicknesses. But that's not the important part in this passage. The important thing is, he had a struggle that he was praying to God, that he was pleading with God for God to resolve. He even looked at it as the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. He looked at this as maybe Satan trying to crush him, which in no doubt Satan would have taken pleasure in doing. So one of the human responses we could have would be this could be a nuisance to be ignored. This is just something that will pass. I can just leave it alone and And maybe tomorrow I'll wake up and it'll be a new day. It'll be something better. We can look at it as a punishment to be endured. 
What did I do wrong, God? Why, why am I going through this? What should I examine? What should I change? Sometimes we look at it as a problem to be solved or a battle to be waged. The problem with that point of view is are you going to fight God? This is a trial that God has allowed in your life to teach you. And by us trying to fix it, we're in, in respects telling God, your will isn't perfect. I'm going to fix this and make it the way it should be. The correct response would be to look at this as a gift to be accepted. Acceptance is the issue. The point of prayer is to get God's will accomplished on earth, not man's will accomplished in heaven. If we look at James chapter 1, verse 2, it's a very short passage here. I just want to look at and uh, highlight something. My brethren, count it all joy for when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith work with patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So as this is a gift, no matter what is going on, not only are we learning from God, God is using this to supply what we need in our future. I can't tell you how many times Kelly and I have gone through hard situations and used those situations that we've learned from to counsel others and to help others. Next, we see that we're to remember what God has already said. When heaven is silent, when we don't hear from God when we're praying, when we're pleading, we need to look to the Bible to see what He has already told us about this situation. Nothing that we're going through is unique in God's eyes. Everything we're going through has, ha has happened and has been explained through the Bible on how we should respond. As you see in verse 7, chapter, or in verse 7 uh, at the beginning, uh, Paul uses the verbiage abundance of the revelations. The Bible is full of stories, cover to cover, of God explaining to us how to handle every situation that you and I are going to come in contact with. The biggest thing I think of is when we read through Psalms. We can th flip back and forth through Psalms and we listen to the questions that these men are asking God. The the abandonment that sometimes these men feel, and then how they have come through it and what they've learned from it. When we get beaten down and when we hit temptations and when we hit hard times that will come, the Bible expects us to look to the Bible for the answers. God has already given us, from Genesis to Revelations, Revelations being the last book, he has given us everything we need to learn and to live our lives. But most of the time, when you and I run into diverse temptations and run into situations, it's easier for us to fix it ourselves or for us to ignore it than for us to face it and see how God would have us to deal with it. That being said, the third thing that we come across is that we need to continue to pray. Paul says in verse 8 that he prayed for this thrice times. Now that doesn't mean he prayed three small little prayers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and just added an addendum on the end saying, oh, and by the way, I have this pain. Can you please take it away? No, this was Paul pleading with God, saying, I have this infirmity. It is, it is hindering my ability to serve you. Can you please take it away? But instead of God taking his his inadequacies away, God's strength was shown through Paul's inadequacies, through Paul's pain. That being said, Paul didn't quit praying after his first one, after his first month or two months or three months of pleading. He didn't quit praying after his second one. He quit praying when Jesus changed his heart. If we look at verse 8 towards the end, it says, my this is Jesus, or towards 9, sorry. Jesus' response was, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect 
and weakness. That was Jesus' whole response. And Paul's response to that was, Therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities. Because of Jesus' response, he knows this is something he is going to have to live with and that God is going to get the glory out of it. That's one thing that Christians, we, we look at, oh, that guy, he must have done something wrong. Look at what he's going through. Or this guy, he didn't tithe enough because he's, he's having financial struggles. Or this guy didn't go to church enough because he's having spiritual struggles. Instead of praying for them, instead of having coming alongside them and helping them, we turn to judging them. We can look at various examples in the Bible of the same situation where Jairus asked for healing for his daughter who was dying. That was the same word that was used with Paul. When, he, when Paul says, I besought the Lord thrice, Jairus used that same word in the Hebrew, or sorry, in the Greek, of besought. It was that same word, that same verbiage, that pleading, that on the ground, this is something that I cannot do in myself. We look at the same with the leper who sought cleansing from his leprosy. And the servant who besought his master for mercy because he owed a debt that he could not pay. It's that same word, and the reason that it's that same word is because it has that deep feeling that this is not something that in my human strength I could ever fix. Um, I, I, I try to think of some of the thorns in the side that I could come up with in my life. and Some of them are headaches. This last couple weeks, some of you know I've been gone out of church because of shingles and just complication after complication. And, and that's kind of where this sermon came out of is my wife sent me a book to read on prayer. And that sometimes God ans- God's answer is my strength is going to be shown through your week. My strength is going to come to others because you are not strong enough to do it on yourself. I like this acronym I found on the internet when I did a quick Google search of examples of of current day people struggling with this because we, we read the Bible, but I try to find examples of people in today's society that are dealing with these situations. And I came across this acronym, PUSH. I'm, I've heard it before when I was in college. Some of you might have heard it. Pray until something happens. This doesn't mean God is going to give you a yes or no answer audibly. This doesn't mean that God is going to give you what you're asking for. This means God's going to give you what you're asking for or He's going to change your heart. The Bible says God gives you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean He's going to give you what you desire. That means He's going to change your heart to match His desires. The next thing comes in in contact with that. After we pray, we're to listen for God's voice. My wife can attest to this, that if something happens, I'm of the personality and the type to jump on it and fix it. As she'll see before a church this morning, I got an email. We have a huge, brand new system at work going into production tomorrow morning. It's never random prod. My boss is the one that designed it. He's got this week off. I'm filling in for him as ETL lead during this week on a system that I didn't design that's hitting broad this week. So I get an email this morning that says, the load failed. I sent a quick, I don't know, maybe a sentence email saying, hey, try this, try this, try this. Had to give it to God and say, God, I have so much on my plate today. I'm trying to keep my focus on you. I'm trying to be where I should spiritually and not let things sidetrack me like Satan always tries to do. Um, after the morning service, I checked my email again and lo and behold, it was some simple fix that, uh, that they were able to implement and didn't need me. Um, but that temptation to say, well, you guys go to church, I've got to stay home and fix this, was there. But knowing that God has control of everything, and this 
production job doesn't hit till tomorrow. So even though I have the personality to fix it now, it's gonna weigh on me all day. I can't let it sit. I had to let it sit. I had to get through the day and ignore it and not even think about it because I know it's something that would probably end up consuming my day when there's other people that can handle it. So the next, the listen for God's voice where he says, my grace is sufficient. Uh, in the first few days after September 11th, as the country came together and many, many volunteers from all over the country, from California and some from Canada, some from other areas of the world, came together to find the survivors. There's a technology company, one of the ones I used to work for, IBM, donated a bunch of listening devices so that a guy could go on 10 stories of rubble and put this listening device down and hear a heartbeat from a thousand feet away. That's how strong this was. The problem with it was these searchers, these volunteers, had trucks in the background moving girders, moving stuff out of the way, had F-16 fighter jets flying overhead, had sirens going around nonstop. They had to stop, listen, and concentrate, and wait. All they could do is wait until they hear that small, faint voice, and they knew where to go. In our daily lives, we have so many things competing for our attention. And we often, too often, ignore that small voice inside of us. That voice that says, if you would just sit and listen, if you would just wait for me to work in the situation you're in, if you would stop trying to fix it, I would make it work out the way it should. Be still and know that I am God. A lot of times we want to limit where we hear the voice from. Elijah didn't hear the voice where he expected. He didn't hear it in a great wind or he didn't hear it in the fire. He didn't hear it in the earthquake. He heard it in a gentle whisper. Something where if he would have been moving, if he would have been acting, he would have missed what he was waiting for. We also see that God used a little boy by the name of Samuel to cause Eli to hear his voice. If you're waiting for a miraculous vision or a miraculous slap on the head or something to fly in front of your face with neon lights telling you what God wants, you're going to miss what God's trying to show you. In the middle of a crisis, you may hear all kinds of voices. You may hear unsaved family members that you look at as maybe smart or intelligent people telling you to do this or telling you from a logical standpoint you need to go this way or from a logical standpoint you need to go this way. But God doesn't deal on the realm of human logic. God deals on the realm of heavenly perfectness. Some of the the stuff I've been learning in our classes uh, at Tyndale is that to interpret difficult or unclear passages of a Bible, which a lot of times we hit, we look at other passages that are easy, other passages that have been defined and use those to help us understand the difficult ones. And I look at that in our same in our Christian life when we're going through these hard times. God's got, I don't know, a two, three thousand page book here that tells you how to do it, tells you exactly what to do, And this is the last place we look. A lot of times we want to judge what we're feeling by what has already been revealed to us in the Bible. But a lot of times we have that feeling of, yeah, but that might be too hard. I don't know if I can do what what this specific passage is saying and and maybe it's in a different context or maybe he didn't mean it that way in my situation so I'm not going to do what the Bible says. I'm going to go here and try this. 
and then it fails. And then I'm going to go here and I'm going to try this and then it fails. Instead of looking at what the Bible says and just enacting what we already know what to be true. Next, the fifth thing is we see that we are to trust in God's power. My strength is made perfect in weakness. We all know and we hear day after day after day that it's God's power that carries us through. It's God's power that carries us through. But when push comes to shove and you lose your job, are you trusting in God to supply the next one? My wife and I went through this in 2008 where her hours got cut down to next to nothing and I lost my job due to layoffs. And it came to the point where we had to decide, are we going to trust in God or are we going to run like a chicken with their head cut off? And our first reaction is, i got to do this, i got to do this, i got to do this, i got to do this. Instead of sitting there, pouring our heart to God and pleading to God and letting Him handle that situation. There was a, a story of a little boy who went to a Christian school and asked his Christian teacher if she had seen his pack of marbles. She said, no, I hadn't seen it all day. I saw it yesterday when you were here. And the little boy says, can we pray about it? The teacher says, yeah, we can pray about it. The next day, the little boy comes back and the teacher hesitantly asked the boy, did you find your marble? He looked at her and said, no, but God took my desire away. And that's exactly what our situation should be. No matter what the end result is, we know it's God's plan. I want to look at Paul's situation here. Is he had this thorn in his side. Like I said, we don't know what it is, but I can imagine in his rationale and in the rationale of others around him, if that would just be gone, he could be such a, a better witness for Christ. He would be so much stronger in the eyes of the people here witnessing to, and, and he could reach farther than what he could reach with this, this, this issue. But God knew the temptation for him to take that credit was there. And by Paul having the effect he had, no matter what situations he was in, God got the glory. He thought he could be a more effective servant if things would just line up the way he thought they should line up. My wife and I are getting ready in the next who knows how many years to be in full-time ministry. And we're in the planning phase, the long planning phase of completing a degree and making sure we don't accrue any more debt and getting the little bit we have left paid off. And, and uh, we know all the things that are going to be asked of us by mission boards and and while mission boards aren't going to accept you if you're this, or mission boards aren't going to accept you if you're this, and if you, went to, if you have this degree from this college, they're not going to accept you. And there's all these things we have to take into consideration. And I sit here and ask myself, why do I have to go through a mission board? Why do I have to go through a board to send me somewhere when they're going to, when, when they're going to try and keep me like a little puppet instead of me having my sole answer to God? I'm going to have a middleman there that controls everything, controls my funding. If that mission board changes its doctrine and I don't, my funding's cut. There's all these situations you have to come up with, but instead, my wife and I are at the point where we're like, well, we know we need to finish the degree. We know we need to be debt-free. So that's where we work. We pray for the rest and see what God has. The last thing I want to look at is, are you serving God right where you are? When Paul says, I take pleasure in my infirmities, his answer from God gave him a zeal that wasn't there before. 
gave him a strength that he did not have before, knowing that even though he has this situation in his, in his plate, he's with an almighty God that will carry him through it. Sometimes you want God to change your situation, but did you ever think that God has put you in that situation to use you while you're in it? Instead of sitting on the couch and waiting for it to pass, we may be using that opportunity to show others what God is doing in that situation while it's happening. We don't need to wait 10 years after to tell people what happened. This is a situation that God is using us to reach others. One of the quotes I got from a book I was reading says, Don't ask God to change things until you've looked for and found how you can minister or be changed by the circumstances you face. Everything we're in is an opportunity to either change ourselves or to minister to others. God doesn't do anything without reason. I think of a story, most of you might know it, I'll probably butcher her name. I think it's spelled Joni Erickson Tata. Most of you guys have probably heard the story. Uh, it's a young teenage girl that, is, uh, I'm not exactly sure what her life's goal was, but she was uh, in diving competitions and swimming. And she misjudged the distance or the depth of a pool and she dove in and hit her head. She spent, spends, I think she's still alive, the rest of her life as a quadriplegic. In one of the books she wrote, she admits that the first year or so she blamed God. She blamed Christians. But God used this and changed her life about a year in. She took up art. A quadriplegic that could move her head, that's about it, could move her arms to paint, yet she began to paint. She began to write books. She began to counsel with other women and people that were dealing with situations that she was in. She began to come alongside the men and women that were dealing with these struggles. My wife was telling me the other day about someone that she heard of that received a, a letter, a handwritten letter, a personal letter from her encouraging her because she heard of this situation. She took the situation God had her in learned from it and used it to change the lives of others. In, con in conclusion, some of you may be familiar with the name K. Arthur. Uh, she's written several Christian books. She has her own radio program. Um, I'm not too familiar with her myself. I've read about her in a few books. Um, but she tells about, she, she's a widow that had two kids when her, when her husband died. She tells about a day when, shortly after her husband's passing, that she came home and couldn't bring herself to walk through the front door. Carrying a, a box of books, staring at the long patch of grass between her and her house. Her mind went back to when she was a child and she was terrified at something, and she was running to her dad. Her dad scooped her up. She immediately knew she was safe where she was at. I want to read a small passage. It's funny, I laughed when Pastor, Mies, or Pastor Aaron this morning said, well, you're not supposed to read small blips of passages during a sermon, but I'm going to do it. So now I'm going to do it. I had it planned anyways, but I second thought it when you mentioned that. I also second thought it because one of my thorns in the flesh is being emotional when I preach. I've tried disconnecting my emotions from it, but it doesn't work. 
when you're preaching on something that God has taught you and trained you with, sometimes it's just hard to it's hard to keep that in when the Holy Spirit is grabbing your heart sometimes the only thing you're most can do is cry every time I've read this passage I begin to weep Every time I read this little blip of this book, I began to weep just because of the pure image and how we should see our Holy Father. Okay, here it is. As she stared at the grass, her mind went back to a time in her childhood when she had been running through the grass toward her dad, terrified and screaming. He had scooped her up in his arms and given her comfort. She wished that she could go back to that time as a little girl again. She wished she had someone to hold her right then. As she turned to go into her house, she suddenly saw herself in her mind's eye. A little girl with pigtails flying down a vast corridor of marble floors oil paintings bigger than life hanging on the walls. She could hear her little shoes on the marble floors and see the tears running down her cheeks. It was a long corridor. At the end, two huge golden doors glistened in the sunlight which filtered through the beveled cathedral windows. On either side was an imposing, on either side of the imposing doors stood two magnificently dressed guards holding huge spears and blocking the entrance into the room beyond. Undaunted, the little girl ran straight toward the door, still crying, Abba! She never broke her stride. For as she neared the doors, the guards flung open the doors and heralded her arrival. The daughter of the king! The daughter of the king! court was in session. The cherubim and seraphim cried, holy, holy, holy. And the elders sat on their thrones, dressed in white, wearing crowns of gold and talking with the king of kings. But one of his, or but one, but sorry, but none of this slowed his daughter. Obviously, or oblivious to everything, Going on around her, she ran past the seven burning lamps of fire and up the steps leading to the throne. She catapulted herself into the king's arms. She was home and wrapped in the arms of his everlasting love. He reached up and with one finger gently wiped away her tears Then he smoothed the sticky hair on her face back into her braids and said, Now, now, tell your father about it. Kay walked into her house, left the books on the table, walked through her house, and knelt beside her bed. Then she proceeded to tell her father all about it. The lesson that we learned from Paul, one of the things that we learned from the lives of other believers is that God does not take away every struggle. God does not grant every request. Nor does he quench every pain. But he will always be there to gently wrap his arms of love, wipe our tears, and give us the strength and motivation to live another day. How are you going to respond when he says no? Are you going to push him away like so many do? Are you going to pull him tighter than you ever have before and let him wrap his arms around you? I was telling the truth, Tracker kids, this, uh, I think uh, two or three weeks ago, we are trying to explain the importance of reading our Bible and, and praying to third and fourth graders, ones that just want to be outside and play. One of my explanations 
that kind of hit me that night. And I've been thinking about ever since is that we have a Holy Father that left everything to gain fellowship with me. And yet I'm too busy to give Him the fellowship that He sacrificed everything for. When we come to prayer, we need to know God's answer might be not what we want, but we need to trust that His answer is exactly what we need. Heavenly Father, we thank You for today. We thank You for the struggles that You've brought us through. We thank You for the hard times that we've seen with family and the passing of family and the passing of friends and and the sickness. And we thank You for it because we know that You have brought others to You through those. We know that You have taught us and You have trained us to be stronger Christians and that we have a brighter light because of it. We ask that You would give us the strength today and tomorrow and into the future to deal with everything that we have in our plates. Sometimes we fear the future, but Lord, I thank You for the fact that we can be joyous knowing that You hold the future and that no matter whatever happens, we're right where You need us. Lord, I pray that You would be with us tonight as we leave, that we would... spend time with you in prayer tonight. That we would humble ourselves knowing that we are not worthy of your love, but you gave it anyways. We ask that you would just wrap your loving arms around our country. We ask that you would draw the country to you. We know this can hurt. We know sometimes it's not comfortable, but we know it's necessary for us to be the Christians that you want us to be. And we thank you for that in your your name. Amen. Hymn number 113, shall we please? He giveth more grace. Hymn number 113. Shall we stand together? So if during the course of the prayer, if you're not a member and you care not to stay, although you are welcome to stay, you can certainly leave at that time. We invite you to stay, however, and it'll be a short meeting. Uh, Kirk Tobias will be 